uh, welcome everybody. Um, it's nice to have you all here. And um, it is my pleasure to introduce Pramod for today's talk. So Pramod received his, uh, both his master's degree uh, in electrical engineering and a PhD in uh, neuroscience and electrical engineering uh, from the in India Institute of Science in Bangalore. That's the super fancy top place for science in India. And while he was there, um, Pramod worked with Arun um, on a whole host of interesting questions about visual perception uh, in people and machines and the relationship between the two. And that included work on the role of symmetry in object perception and uh, the optimality of peripheral blur for object recognition. And in my lab, he's been working with me and Josh Tenenbaum um, looking at um, a topic at the core of CBMM's interest, and that's how we reason about the physical world. Um, and I find this super exciting because it's just kind of wide open and fundamental um, to human cognition. Uh, and it's an area where we're starting to get serious computational models to test and one where we think we're starting to know where to look in the brain. So there's all kind of cool stuff to do here and Pramod will tell you about it. So take it away, Pramod. Hi all, uh, thanks Nancy for that introduction and uh, thanks to CBMM for giving me this opportunity to present my work on invariant representation of physical stability in the human brain. So this is a picture of an everyday kitchen scene. Uh, just from the snapshot, we see not just a glass, but a glass supported by the table, a glass that contains milk, that is precariously placed on the edge of the table. And someone who is not careful enough might bump into it, causing the milk to spill all across the floor and possibly even shattering the glass into pieces. So understanding the physics of the world is useful in various everyday circumstances to plan actions and interact with our surroundings. It could be as simple as stacking dishes in a pile in the kitchen sink without breaking any of them where and how to walk on the Cambridge sidewalks during winter without injuring oneself, play a game of billiards and not suck at it, and even invent new ways of using common everyday objects. This intuitive understanding of the physical world around us is considered to be a part of core knowledge, along with other mental faculties that help us understand agents and their intentions. As such, many of these intuitive physical abilities are present even in infants. Four-month-old infants understand that solid objects cannot pass through each other. And at around five months, they have different expectations of solids and liquids. Infants also understand that objects cannot just float in the air, but do need support. And by around 11 months, they also understand stability. And as early as three and a half months, infants have an understanding that object can only be lowered into an open top container and not a closed top container. In other words, the relationship of container. And finally, infants can already reason about gravity and understand how objects move under its influence. From studying human behavior uh, in adult humans, we also know that we make use of this knowledge about the physics of the world to make various sophisticated inferences. We can tell whether a block tower is stable or unstable and robustly judge its stability depending on the mass and material properties of the blocks. We can quickly infer relative weights of objects and update our beliefs about the weights of these objects if the outcome of an interaction violates our expectation we can determine what might have happened if not for a possible cause that led to certain outcome of interaction between objects. We can also infer material properties like viscosity just from a snapshot. And we can also predict the paths taken by solid objects and fluids under the influence of gravitational force. Interestingly, understanding the physics of the world is not only important for us humans, but it also is essential and of fundamental import in the field of robotics, whose aim is to build robots that interact and navigate in the world, just like humans do. Recent advances in this field have shown that including a module that learns the physical properties and relationships of wooden blocks 
does indeed help a robot to master the game of Jenga. Physical reasoning capabilities also enhance problem solving abilities of robots by leveraging proper tool usage and planning sequential manipulation of objects in the environment. And finally, learning physical properties of liquid by performing one task like stirring will help robot efficiently perform another task like pouring. By now, I hope I have convinced you about the importance of this core ability that we have to understand and use the physics of the world. Robotics still lag behind human performance in large part because robots do not understand the physics of the scene they're in. How do humans do this then? There is some recent evidence uh, that regions in the parietal and frontal cortices of the human brain, uh, shown here in blue and green, respond more when people are performing a physics-based task compared to a difficulty-matched color judgment task. Further, these same regions have been shown to carry invariant information about the mass of objects through a series of clever experimental manipulations. Now that I've given you a brief overview of what we know about intuitive physical reasoning in minds, brains, and machines, I will tell you something about a couple of ideas out there regarding how physics is computed in the brain. Since these are still early days and we don't have a lot of direct evidence from the brain, there are two dominant views of how this physics related information is computed in the brain. One view hypothesizes that a representation similar to those that underlie object recognition in feed forward neural networks is sufficient for intuitive physical reasoning. Whereas another view hypothesizes that our brain performs intuitive physical judgments through probabilistic simulations similar to those seen in video game physics engines. Claims for evidence of this pattern recognition view comes from both behavioral and computational experiments. Humans are able to find the oddball target in an array of distractors defined only on how stable or unstable the target is compared to the distractors arguing that stability is extracted pre-attentively. And humans can also detect in changes, or detect changes in block towers better only when the said change affected the stability of the tower, even though changes in stability were totally incidental to the task manipulation. Further, a few studies have shown that feedforward neural networks, similar to those used for object recognition, can detect stability of block towers and in many cases perform as well as humans. On the other hand, uh, evidence for the simulation viewpoint also come from a variety of behavioral and computational studies. Uh, the influential paper introducing the concept of intuitive physics engine showed that a model that performs approximate probabilistic simulations was able to match human decisions and uncertainties regarding the stability of block towers. Other experiments also showed that a probabilistic simulation-based account also explained how objects would move after collisions, when the bob of a pendulum is cut while in motion, how humans make judgments of causality by running counterfactual simulations, and how fluids collide and move under the influence of gravity. The two viewpoints that I have presented here need not be necessarily dichotomous in the sense that claims for feedforward processing, either because of its pre-attentive nature or faster reaction times, need not exclude simulation as the underlying computation. However, exploring this directly in the human brain uh, will provide data to constrain these explanations. So in order to address some of these issues uh, and explore how aspects of intuitive physics is represented in the human brain, uh, we considered stability as a good case study. Because of all the predictions we make about our physical world, stability is the most basic prediction. Whether the situation in front of us is stable and hence likely to stay the same, or unstable and hence likely to change in the immediate future. Moreover, understanding stability is to understand whether anything about the scene will change at all in the near future. With this in mind, we set out to address four specific questions about physical stability in the human brain. First, we asked if representations in a feed-forward neural network trained on object recognition can be useful for detecting physical stability. Second, 
we asked if representations underlying object recognition in the human brain in the ventral temporal cortex can distinguish between physical stability and instability. In essence, both these questions are geared towards assessing the pattern recognition and specifically the object recognition viewpoint. Third, we asked if the frontoparietal regions, the ones I showed before, that respond more to physics tasks and carry invariant information about object mass can also carry invariant information about physical stability. Finally, we asked if stability was represented in the brain by carrying out forward simulations. To answer the first question, uh, that is whether feed forward neural networks trained on object recognition carry information about physical stability we created a data set of images that depicted physical stability or instability. We started with a set of images of unstable and stable block towers because it was used in a previous study and also in order to replicate their findings. One thing to note here is that some of the previous study used pre-trained features from a deep neural network, convolutional neural network or CNN trained on object recognition or fine-tuned a pre-trained CNN to distinguish between stable and unstable block towers, like the ones I'm showing here. However, the way the generalizability of these classifiers were tested was by training them on block towers with three blocks and testing them on block towers with two or five blocks. We thought that this way of testing generalizability really does not capture the gamut of scenarios in which we humans are capable of distinguishing between stable and unstable configuration of objects. So we created another set of images, this time depicting stable and unstable configuration of objects denoted here as physical object scenario. These images depicted recognizable everyday objects and we tried to match the objects as much as possible across the stable and unstable scenarios. Finally, uh, we created a third set of images to test the generalizability across naturalistic scenarios. The images in this set depicted people in stable or unstable situation, like the ones I've shown here. And the thing to note here is that even though it includes people, the instability itself arises from a precariously placed object, like the ladder, for example. So with these set of images, we set out to answer our first hey, question. Pramod, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious how you made the images. So, uh, Okay. Yeah, so these uh, were some of the images I actually got off the internet. Uh, so, and the ones, uh, the block towers that I'm showing here were actually used in a previous study. Uh, they actually photographed these uh, and the way they photographed the unstable towers is by actually holding a stick on top and clicking a picture just after removing the stick so that it stays stable during that frame. And I mean, in some cases, you can also see the stick here. Yeah. And uh, these ones I got off the internet. Uh, and uh, these ones too. Uh, there's this funny sort of meme uh, called why men, uh, why women live longer than men, uh, where you have these funny scenarios of people sort of doing various actions on precariously placed ladders and some really stupid uh, scenarios. So, Thanks. yeah. I have a quick follow up on that question from what for the for the unstable blocks. It's funny when you you, you mentioned like the, the stick that's poking. I wonder if a deep net, maybe you're going to talk about this later, catches that bias kind of in the famous radiology paper of, oh, they can detect um, tumor just because the quality of the image is better and not because you know, it's actually detecting the signal the right way. But I don't know, you can <laughs> answer that later. But. I think it could have been that way, but uh, what they also say uh, in the data set is that they use the same sort of stick situation, even in the case of stable images, just to maintain uh, similar scenarios. That, yeah. makes that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. But Pramod, you might mention how you filtered your stimuli or at least checked to make sure they weren't decodable in an early layer of a component. So at least there wasn't. That, some that's right. Yeah, yeah. So uh, for all the images that I'm showing here, I mean, or at least the ones that I used for the experiment, I just passed them through uh, the initial layer, con layer of a deep neural network, just to see if there are certain low level properties that would sort of give you this decodability. 
So, and then only after passing that test, I mean, I chose images which could not be decoded from the early layers. And that did, uh, then did all the, all the rest of the analysis. So we collected these three uh, set of scenarios and uh, we rationalized that any system that has understood the concept of physical stability should be able to detect stability in all these three scenarios. And uh, as far as the neural network is concerned, we chose a ResNet 50 architecture trained on the ImageNet data set for object recognition. A shallower variant of this model with lower object recognition performance was previously used for stability classification. So if anything, this network should improve on earlier results regarding stability classification. So how did we test the neural network for stability classification? For each scenario, we extracted unit activations or features from the final fully connected layer of the network and trained a linear support vector mission or SVM classifier to distinguish between feature patterns for stable and unstable images using cross-validation. Uh, what should we expect to find here? If there is generalizable information about physical stability in the feature representation learned by this neural network through training on object recognition, we should find not only uh, that it should have about chance classification within each scenario, but also significantly about chance classification performance when trained on one scenario and tested on another. So we replicated earlier findings that training a classifier on block towers would give about chance classification performance on held out block towers. Interestingly, we also found that deep neural network features contained information about physical stability independently for the physical object scenario and also the physical people scenario. However, when we trained the classifier on one scenario or, and tested on another scenario, the performance dropped to near chance levels, indicating that the pre-trained CNN features can discriminate physical stability within a scenario, but not across scenarios. So to answer our first question, no, feedforward ImageNet trained deep neural networks previously claimed to support stability judgments do not carry information about stability that generalizes to novel scenarios. So let's move on to our next question where we asked if brain regions that are thought to be optimized for object recognition in the ventral temporal cortex carried scenario invariant information about physical stability. Again, just to motivate why we are asking this question of the ventral temporal cortex, we know that VTC, uh, the ventral temporal cortex, is involved in object recognition and is also well modeled by convolutional neural networks trained on ImageNet object classification. So will we find similar results to CNNs in this brain region too? Pr Pramad, before you go on to the next section, can I ask just a kind of a conceptual question? Yeah, sure. I, I, I'm not sure, I, I guess part of the reason you're asking this question is because past research groups uh, asked similar questions, but I guess I just don't really get why we would expect object recognition, a, a network trained for object recognition or, the, or parts of the brain that are possibly specialized for object recognition to contain information about physical stability. Because it, it just seems to me that if we think of object recognition as categorizing into types of objects, there's a huge amount of variation within, a, within each object class, a huge amount of physical variation, right? Like right. there's things that I can classify as, you know, plates and stacks of plates and cups and diff different physical configurations. And some of them are stable, some of them are unstable. I just don't see why, you know, why we would ever expect that to be involved, you know, related to physics. That's right. So I think one answer could be that, uh, for example, if you take a scenario of block towers, uh, one way to sort of distinguishing between stable and unstable block towers is to just figure out what the center of mass is, or like mm -hmm. centroid of the object is, which is very sort of simple to compute in terms of visual features. And potentially uh, a region that is optimized for recognizing objects could also have information about the extent of the object or the centroid of these objects that would in turn help you distinguish between stable and unstable block towers. Right, I mean, I agree with you that there's some, it, it seems relevant that 
I mean, there's obviously going to be visual features that are that carry information about uh, for our physical judgments, right? Um, but it's just not clear to me why uh, object recognition per se is relevant for physical. Sam, uh, Sam, just to jump in, we didn't think it would either. It was sort of like, you know, Firestone and these guys are saying, oh, it's just like object recognition. It's the same kind of thing. It's just pattern classification. Yeah, I think I think there's two, but I think I think you sh we should distinguish two or at least two versions of this hypothesis that several groups, including Chaz Firestone, Brian Scholl, but also several computer vision groups have argued. One is that in some sense, yeah, it's just the same as object or scene classification. So the same networks, like 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 a Coco uh, with, um, uh, Alvarez, with George yeah. Alvarez, right? Yeah. I mean, they actually, I think, took pre-trained networks and just linearly decoded for certain classes of block towers and claimed that that was yeah. the way to do it. So what, one is that it's like literally the same representations can be quickly repurposed for this and that that would be consistent with the fact that it's very quickly processed, you know, in 100 milliseconds or less and all that. But the other, another possibility of sort of a generalization of that is it's not exactly the same, you know, circuitry or the same representations, but the same kind of network, like yeah. a deep convent could be used for this. And, you know, both of those, I think, are hypotheses that like at least some serious people are taking seriously and they're, they might be part of the picture. So we, we do want to take them seriously, but yeah, the, the, the strongest version that we're testing right here, that it's like literally just a pre-trained object recognition network. You know, I don't know how, like, how much I would really have expected that to work in the first place. Yeah, um, yeah. No, that, that that's basically what I was trying to get at, which is that it, it seems more plausible to me potentially that, that the latter possibility that Josh just described. Yeah. I mean, actually, even more plausible is a version where if you're trained to do physical inference, you object information becomes useful for that, right? But it seems less yeah obviously yeah. the other way around well yeah or, right well or, or that yeah i mean an another view is that there's some kind of yeah, generalizable representation of like 3d object geometry and scene geometry that's kind of jointly useful for for all these things yeah. and yeah. um yeah but it'd be nice to test a version um where the problem is we don't have anything like an image net scale data set for training just feed forward visual physics right <laughs> it'd be nice if we could test something like that um, I'm not sure how we would do that. Maybe some kind of motion, you know, contrastive, like unsuper or self-supervised or contrastive losses on motion. A lot of people have been trying to learn things in that setting, like Dan Yamans and others have a network on that and Bre Brendan Lake. So maybe we could try taking those visual representations and seeing if, seeing the same kind of idea. That might be a, another thing to do. Coco is actually right. on the call. I don't know if you wanted to say something. <laughs> You're putting him on the spot. <laughs> uh, no, I don't mind actually. I was, I was gonna try and hop in. So I, think, I like putting Coco on the spot. <laughs> so I think the, the claim that I would basically make for, yeah. the, for the sake of you know decoding stability from object recognition is not that it's anything about object recognition per se. It's about the extent to which object recognition is able to generate features that are then usable in other tasks. So to the extent that object recognition is good at, you know, more like more like an intuitive geometry per se. Like to the extent that object recognition gives you Yeah, that's that's what I was that's that's what I was trying to channel right. there in the last thing I said. Yeah. But we might think that there might be other ways of doing that, maybe using some like more general like video data sets for which would be an intuitive geometry and dynamics that might be more physical. Yeah. And we might we're, want to test that too. Yeah. We're actually trying to replicate some earlier object recognition results with just like contrast of learning networks so that we're kind of getting at this question of like, what exactly are the features that are learned that are most relevant, which is a question you can test more directly by asking, okay, what kind of contrast do you set up in order to produce the features that you think would be relevant for a variety of physical judgment tasks beyond stability, but also with stability. Yeah, I mean, may maybe we, I mean, we could even, you know, even collaborate or at least coordinate like because I think we're interested in the same thing, even if we're coming from different places. So it'd be good to, we could have a, a separate offline discussion of like, what are the right, uh, you know, self-supervised or contrastive losses that could plausibly be tested in these different cases and try out the yeah. same networks and stuff. Cool. I'm in. Let's follow up on that. Okay, great. So here uh, we wanted to ask if brain regions that are thought to underlie object recognition in the ventral temporal cortex also carried scenario invariant information about physical stability. Uh, so to do that, uh, we again considered images from the two scenarios that were previously used, the, the physical objects and the physical people scenario. However, uh, one could argue that any difference between stable and unstable conditions we might see in the brain could be explained away by attention. 
people precariously placed on ladders might simply draw more attention. So as a control, uh, we also included a third scenario where people were in either perilous or non-perilous conditions, but due to animals. This has the same danger or peril that the other scenario has, but the peril in this case is directly due to an animal rather than a precariously placed physical object. So with these three scenarios, uh, we set out to address the second question. That is whether brain regions known to be involved in object recognition also contain information about physical stability. So we collected fMRI brain responses to these conditions using a block design uh, and an orthogonal one back task uh, to ensure that the participants were focused on the images. Throughout the task, the participants were asked to fixate uh, on the center of the image, uh, which we then confirmed using eye tracking on a subset of participants. So we then defined our region of interest in the brain, the ventral temporal cortex, uh, shown here on an inflated cortical surface, and asked if pattern of activations in this region contained information about physical stability. Specifically, we uh, looked for such information using a multi-voxel pattern, pattern correlation analysis. So within each scenario, uh, we split the data into two halves and asked if the pattern correlations within conditions, yeah, pattern correlation within conditions shown here as RW1 and RW2 are greater than pattern correlations between conditions uh, shown as RB1 and RB2. So this will simply indicate how similar are the voxel activity patterns within the condition. Higher within condition correlations would indicate that the activity patterns for the two conditions are distinctive in this region of the brain. So what are we expecting to find? So if the neural network results are anything to go by, this analysis should reveal information about physical stability within each scenario. So what did we find? Uh, we found that the within condition correlations were significantly higher than the between condition correlations in the physical objects scenario and also in the physical people scenario. However, the pattern information did not distinguish perilous from non-perilous conditions in the animal people scenario. So VDC carries uh, pattern information about physical stability within scenarios similar to what we saw in object recognition trained CNNs. But what we have not answered yet is if this information is scenario invariant. So to answer that, we again used pattern correlation analysis and computed within and between condition correlations, but now across scenario types. That is the within condition correlations were for stable conditions in say the physical objects and physical people scenarios. And the between condition correlations were for the stable condition in physical object scenario and unstable condition in physical people scenario. So again, shown here as RWs and RBs. So we found that within condition correlations were not different from between condition correlations for pairs of scenarios involving animal people as one of the scenarios. This is what we would have expected given that the nature of instability or peril is different. One has instability due to the physical properties of objects, whereas the other has peril due to an animal. However, the crucial comparison here is for the two physical scenarios, that is the physical objects and the physical people scenarios. So what did we find here? Interestingly, uh, here too, we found that the within condition correlations were not that different from between condition correlations, indicating that the ventral temporal cortex does not carry scenario invariant information about physical stability. So to answer the second question, uh, we found that similar to CNNs trained on object recognition, the part of the brain known to have representations and functions necessary for object recognition, the VTC, also does not carry scenario invariant uh, information about physical stability. But since we know that we can easily recognize stability regardless of the scenario, surely there must be some part of the brain uh, involved in its processing. Where might that be? So taking a cue from a couple of previous studies in the lab, 
we hypothesized that the frontoparietal regions that responded more to physics tasks and carried invariant information about object mass might also carry scenario invariant information about physical stability. To explore this, uh, we used the same physics versus non-physics uh, task localizer used in the previous studies and functionally localized the candidate physics regions uh, in each participant. So what are our predictions uh, for this brain region? If this brain region is involved in processing physics information, then we should find information about physical stability in this region. So we address this uh, again by using the same pattern correlation analysis to first ask if there was any reliable information about stability within each scenario in the candidate physics regions. As before, we found that the within condition correlations were stronger than the between condition correlations. Oops. Uh, but only in the physical objects and the physical people scenarios, uh, but not in the animals people scenario. This is similar to what we found in the ventral temporal cortex. And the question now is uh, whether we might find similar results even for the across scenario comparisons. So if this region, uh, the physics ROI that we have defined here is simply reflecting the processes in the ventral visual pathway we should find no generalizable information for physical stability. So let's see what we found. Again, we computed pattern correlations within and between conditions across scenarios. And uh, this time we found that the frontoparietal physics regions did not generalize across physics and animate scenarios. What about the two physics scenarios then? Surprisingly, uh, we found that the frontoparietal physics regions responded similarly to conditions even across scenarios, specifically when the scenarios involved physical objects, indicating that uh, these regions contained abstract scenario invariant information about physical stability. So the fact that we don't see generalization for the animals people condition indicates that these regions uh, or these results are not driven by the perilous nature of some of the stimuli that we've used in the physics scenarios. However, uh, there could be other confounding factors uh, that can easily explain these results as well. So we tested some of them next. So the first confounding factor we checked was low level visual features. Although I told you that these stimuli were uh, considered after sort of passing them through an initial layer of a deep neural network, just to make sure that they're not distinguishable using low level visual features. We uh, wanted to actually test this in the brain uh, in V1. So, and what did we find? We found that there's no uh, pattern information in V1 for generalizable uh, stability representation. So then we asked if any of our results could be due to differential eye movements. There could be systematic differences in where participants fixated, even though they were asked to maintain fixation at the center. Uh, they could have made saccades differently to different locations across different scenarios. Uh, to check this, uh, we collected eye tracking data on a subset of our participants during fMRI and extracted various eye movement variables like the average X and Y positions uh, the number, duration, and amplitude of saccades. We found that none of these variables systematically differed across conditions and scenarios. How fast was the stimuli shown from what in this? Uh, so here, these were uh, shown in a block design uh, with about 10 images in the block with two one backs. So for a total of 12 images. And uh, each image was shown for about 1.7 seconds. Uh, which is a 300 millisecond interstimulus interval. Okay, okay. So, yeah, uh, finally we asked uh, if differential attention uh, to these conditions could explain our results. Uh, though it's hard to quantify attention and uh, sort of explicitly define what we mean by it, uh, we nevertheless wanted to get a measure of it. Uh, so we collected subjective ratings of how interesting our attention grabbing our stimuli were. Uh, we found that as expected, unstable and perilous images were rated higher compared to stable and non-perilous images. However, this effect was not significantly different across all three scenarios, 
indicating that the scenario invariant representation of physical stability cannot be due to differential attention. Thus, low-level visual features, attention, or differential eye movements uh, cannot explain our results. So the simple answer to our third question is yes. Uh, the candidate physics regions in the frontoparietal cortices carry abstract information about physical stability. This already suggests uh, that the representations that potentially underlie our ability to judge physical stability across various scenarios is not similar to those that underlie object recognition. So we will now move on to our final question where we specifically ask if these frontoparietal regions represent physical stability using forward simulation, which is- hey, Pramali, can I just ask one a question before you move on? Yeah. What, what about the possibility that um, implied motion is important? Uh, yes, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, uh, I'm not presenting those results, but just to give you uh, uh, just a sec. Didn't Nancy worked on this like 20 years ago, I think. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, Good memory, Josh. <laughs> yep. So, okay, how do I show this? Well, you're looking for that slide. I'll just say what Zoe Kurtzy and I did was implied motion. So it was photographs of people who are that moment moving, which is subtly different than stability, which is the possibility of motion in the future. So it's it's similar, but not exactly. Well, but, but, the, but the block towers, those are like in the process of starting to move, right? Because we move the right. support, right? I mean, it feels to me like, I mean, yeah. it's almost like th those are very strange stimuli because you just don't ever encounter in, in, in real life, you don't encounter that kind of thing as a yeah. static image, right? I mean, yes, yeah, so although to be fair, the, the block towers were not used in the functional MRI stuff. In the functional so MRI, yeah. the, I see. Yeah, that yeah. would apply yeah. to the earlier confidence. But I think it, but I think it is similar, similar point anyway. I That's mean, right. I mean, one has the, sort the of, physically unstable things should, should have a similar implied motion. Yeah. That's right. Yes. So, yeah, to answer that question, actually, I looked uh, in MT uh, and uh, saw that actually uh, you find higher activations for unstable condition compared to stable across all three scenarios. So, implying that it's not sort of specific to the, the physics conditions. But in general, if anything has an implied motion or a predicted motion, uh, you would find higher responses there. But I guess more generally, like, I, I mean, these stimuli are cool and they obviously do something to your brain. I'm just wondering about like the, the choice to study these particular things with static images. Cause you know, again, in in a real world scenario, I mean, of course, it's very common that you judge stability of things and that's on a continuum and you can make judgments about, oh, well, if I took this thing out, it would fall, right? That, that kind of happens, right? But these yeah. things where it's clearly like about to fall, you know, you don't walk around in, in the world seeing that all the time, you know? Yep. Uh, yeah, but also, I mean, one cool thing about this is, I mean, you can sort of judge this even by looking at a snapshot which uh, is not true for other sort of physics scenarios. So, I mean, in order to just sort of uh, remove the complexity of showing videos. Uh, we but but I, I mean, I, I think that's of course a good point, Pramod, but yeah. I also really like Josh's suggestion because we could do that. Like Toby in our lab and others did some studies like that where you can show a perfectly stable scene and then ask a question like, if this, is, if this thing is removed, like, Imagine that like one of the blocks, you had some kind of block scene or some kind of constructed scenes where one object is red or something. And you say, if I were to remove the red block, would it fall or not? So it's a conditional kind of hypothetical or counterfactual stability judgment. And and people can make those and judgments and probably use the same brain mechanisms. It would be nice right. to show that, but it would be a control because there would be no, there would be no implied motion, at least in the raw stimuli. Although in the mental image, I mean, in, in some sense, you could have imagined that like you get the same, you might still get implied motion effects because to do the simulation, it might top down activate MT, for example. So I don't know that it would completely, but well, that's the as far idea. as like removing that's, it. Yeah, and, and Josh, that's presumably why you see it also for the animals case, which isn't really physical in the same sense, but does yeah. 
predict motion, you also get yeah. this type of response. But it'd be interesting if, I don't know if this, you know, to, to speculate or something like, you know, some of the newer fMRI technologies with super strong magnets can tell the difference maybe between bottom up and top down. Like, yeah. right? like you might expect there could be a difference between somehow like, I don't know, implied motion that's just because like, it's just there in the image versus, and, and some automatically engaged I yeah, know I guess it would still be sort of maybe top down. But anyway, it, it, it seems like there should be a difference. Maybe it's time that it would take or something between automatically engaged implied motion versus like only when you ask yourself the right question, does it? What about, what about like backward masking or something like that? Isn't or that a conventional of... way to try to prevent feedback processing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. or latency of MEG decoding maybe. But that is kind of confounded with the strength of the signal itself, right? I mean, imagining something might be sort of weaker compared to actually seeing something in midair. Well, yeah, they're all in imagined, motion. but is yeah. it like is it like Brian Scholl involuntary? Huh. You know, like Brian's one of Brian's key uh, axioms of it being perception is does it is it fast and automatic? Whereas the conditional simulation that Josh would require for what Josh was suggesting is not automatic. It's only when you think about it. When you think about it, yeah. so. Anyway, it feels like we can talk more about this later. It feels like that'd be an interesting uh, additional experiment um, to do under the right circumstances. I mean, I still think that there's the you know things vary. Configurations vary from being very stable to being like pretty unstable, and you can have things that are not that stable without necessarily being about to fall. It's mostly just like you know, if you if you walked past it and bumped it, it would definitely fall, yeah. as opposed to something that probably wouldn't. You know. And I think I, I think that could be a very fast bottom up yep. thing, right? I mean, so yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. I feel like as a as a parent, I I've become very attentive to. Um, I was thinking the same. Precariously thing. placed things yes. that I think you know people without kids don't think about really. You know, like it it, it really like I feel like it, it it was a massive perceptual learning where it's like now all, all the all the perceptual affordances are really about physical stability and breakability and things like that. Well, you know, Josh and I are talking about. <laughs> oh yeah, I, and I, well, and the other Josh does too. I think it's not an accident that I started working on these things around the time when. <laughs> yeah. But I'll just add that it's not clear whether that's that kind of perceptual learning is top. You want to classify that as top down or automatic, right? Because it feels subjectively like it's automatic, but it's also clearly an effect of the the demands of the environment, right? It's not like everybody is hardwired with that kind of. Th those affordances. I'm not sure about that personally. Mm -hmm. I mean, you definitely become like more cognizant of it when you have kids, but. Hey, I, mean, it's a, it's... I don't have kids and I'm very, yeah. very attuned to things <laughs> leaning over the table edges. <laughs> yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, what I've shown so far is that this abstract sort of scenario invariant information about stability uh, is present uh, only in the frontoparietal physics regions and not in the, in the ventral visual pathway. Uh, so now we'll move on to our final question, uh, where we specifically asked if uh, these frontoparietal regions represent physical stability uh, using forward simulation. So we hypothesized uh, that forward simulation will show up as a univariate difference in neural responses within the physics regions. Why? Uh, because in case of unstable stimuli, uh, there could be more diverse possible outcomes more changes to the scene in the future, that is more predicted motion and hence more activity, uh, compared to stable stimuli, which are what one might call in a sleep state, where no change or motion is predicted and hence don't need to be solved for explicitly. So what did we find? Uh, we computed the average activation uh, for each condition in each scenario within the physics regions. And uh, we found that physical instability uh, evokes a higher response compared to physical stability uh, in the physics regions. But the animate people condition uh, evokes similar activity for both the perilous and non-perilous condition. So this is consistent with uh, the hypothesis that physics regions in the brain might be using forward simulations for inferring physical stability and in general for physical scene understanding. However, for our hypothesis to hold, we should also look in other visual regions and find a null effect. So we looked, uh, and what we found uh, is that none of the visual regions tested uh, 
and we tested, uh, okay, can you see my cursor now? So uh, we tested three visual regions, uh, the primary visual area V1, uh, lateral occipital complex, or LOC, and uh, VTC, as I showed before. And none of these regions actually showed higher responses to instability, physical instability, compared to stability. So what I'm showing here in this table uh, are the average activity values uh, within each visual region for stable and unstable conditions. And uh, the p-value just denotes uh, the, the significance for the appropriate statis statistical test comparing uh, the average activations. As can be seen, uh, none of these scenarios showed a significant univariate response difference, indicating that the trend we observed uh, was unique to the frontal parietal physics regions. So uh, the answer to the final question uh, is that yes, consistent with our hypothesis, we found stronger responses to physical instability, providing an indirect evidence for forward simulations being carried out in these brain regions. So circling back to this debate, we found that representations underlying object recognition in both feed forward convolutional neural networks and the ventral visual pathway do not carry generalizable information about physical stability. However, instead, uh, we found that scenario invariant information uh, about stability is found in the frontoparietal regions uh, that is potentially computed through forward simulations of what will happen next. Although we find evidence suggestive of the simulation hypothesis, there is still a lot more to be known. What I have shown you today is that a pre-trained CNN uh, trained on object recognition cannot detect physical stability across scenarios. However, a neural network specifically trained to do so might. This requires creating a large data set of stable and unstable object configurations across different scenarios. On the contrary, building and testing computational models that extract object-centric representations that explicitly predict future states of the scene by running forward simulations might learn to generalize to novel scenarios faster and match human behavior better. So such models also have uh, the potential to be better encoding models of neural responses in candidate physics regions. In this regard, there has been recent advances in building such object-centric models using graph networks, and we are working towards testing those models on our images to ask whether these models can distinguish between physical stability and instability across scenarios, and also to ask whether these models can predict brain responses in various regions of interest, uh, but mainly in the frontoparietal physics regions. And regarding simulation in the brain, uh, I have presented somewhat an indirect evidence using the univariate analysis of the bold responses. However, collecting high temporal resolution data using electrode grids or ECOG can provide a direct evidence for simulation in these regions and potentially enable us to ask uh, more interesting questions about the nature of simulation itself. Uh, is simulation always running? At what level of detail are these simulations run? So I have to acknowledge here that uh, the actual brain processes uh, that underlie intuitive physics uh, might not be as dichotomous as I've made it out to be. Uh, some problems might as well be solved by appropriating already existing representations for visual object recognition and others by running forward simulations and even some through a combination of both. So finally, uh, from the previous literature and the results I presented today, we know that the candidate physics regions uh, encode invariant object mass and stability. So what are the other physical properties represented in these regions? There are lots of other object related properties uh, like the bounciness or elasticity of these objects and different forces that sort of act on uh, various objects as they interact in the environment, lots of dynamic uh, variables that are involved. And what among these different variables are represented in these candidate frontoparietal physics regions? So we are working towards understanding these aspects of intuitive physics uh, in ongoing and uh, future studies. So with that, uh, I would like to thank my co-authors and mentors, uh, colleagues in the Canvasha lab, uh, the funding sources, and you all uh, for attending this. Uh, uh, and thanks again.